we have right now we have 200 acres, 120 tillable, and most of all of that is in row crop production, uh, with the exception of a little bit of alfalfa. Um, but we have all of our old pasture where you cannot get a 12-row planter that is not planted, and it's all just sitting there idle. So when my son was born, we decided I needed a one of us was going to stay home. I stayed home and became a stay-at-home dad. I needed a hobby. And hopefully one and I can make a little bit of money doing it and fill the freezer and our cupboards and everything else. So, and I grew up on a dairy farm. That's my background. Um, I've worked on dairies. I've worked on ranches. I've never farrowed pigs. Um, that's probably the only thing I haven't done. I've even helped on broiler production in the pig chicken coops, things like that. So, um, but anyway, so... We had all this extra land that was sitting there. It was all old heifer pasture, mainly. Um, so I kept talking to my folks. I said, you know, we need to do something with this. It's just sitting there, and it's idle, and we can do something. But it was all overgrown in box elder and briars, brambles, you name it, blackberry bushes that weren't very good blackberry bushes, and burdock. I'm like, how can we clean this all out without spending hundreds of dollars on diesel fuel and tractor equipment? Trying to clear all this land. Plus, a lot of it's steep and it's north facing. There's some wet spots. Um, so, we looked into pork. You can get pigs, and they, if you've ever seen a pig, which most of you have, it's got a shovel on the front of its face. And they can do a great job of rototilling, man. Even the little ones, 30 pounders, they can do your mom's yard in about a half an hour. Okay? <laughs> yeah, let me tell you, I know this from a fact. But. Um, so our production method that we're like, what we want to do is make sure that we give the pigs clean, fresh air, and a healthy environment, and plenty of exercise. And it's in low, low stress as possible. We don't want to have to pack them into a, into a small pen or a barn, anything like that. Plus we want to be able to train the land and to mow the land as we want, and we want to get some work out of these pigs, right? I mean, they're, if they're gonna be on our farm, they gotta produce. So, we went with rotational grazing, and we just built paddocks, and I got, on a couple sites here, I have an actual layout of our farm. And uh, we just used temporary fencing, and this is one of our good looking girls here, out just after a move, and they just start chowing down, and, they, and we feed our pigs uh, just a regular hog ration and a self feeder. But when we move them, they don't care about that feeder at all. They don't touch it for probably three hours. Because all they want to do is get out in that grass, and it's all, there's, there's white clover, red clover, crabgrass, and a variety of other weeds, et cetera. And they just go nuts, and they just eat. I mean, look, you can see how clean she is. They just, she's really big there. But, um, yeah, and it, by doing this, we can, the low stress, I can buy animals. We buy all of our animals. I don't farrow any. And I can buy animals that maybe wouldn't perform as well in a hog barn situation. You know, they get butted away from the feed, <coughs> things like that. But here it's so low stress that they can actually thrive in this environment. Um, so uh, and that's our, our main goal here. So if you hit the button again. So this is a layout of our farm. Uh, Northfield to be down in this area. And this is all, this is oriented north and south. We're, we're just off a little bit, but. So in this white white line, this is all my perimeter fencing. And this is all just jungle, man. I mean, this stuff is, it's all a north facing slope. This is all like swampy area that dries out in the summer, about August. And uh, it was just sitting there all idle and it's all overgrown. This used to be all cleared out when I was a kid, you know, when I was younger than you guys. And it's just overgrown when we quit farming back in 97. That's the last time this stuff's seen any action. So actually, our, I have one, one small, so our, our setup, I have, this is our perimeter fence. I have one small barn here. When I receive pigs, I'll receive them in the next couple of weeks, or first part of May. Because right now, it's all north basin. There's no grass growing yet. All the south slopes have warmed up, and there's good grass there, but there's nothing on these north slopes. Plus, it's pretty shaded. There's a lot of trees in here. I thinned it out some, um, but 
pigs like to shade too. So I have one small barn here. The first week I have the pigs, they'll stay in this barn. I, it's a small pen, probably half the size of this room. And that's just to make sure everything's going to go well and they transfer well from the farm that I buy them from. The second week I have a small area here. And that's all penned in with, it's triple wire. So we don't have any escapees. And it's electrified fence. And they'll spend the next week to week and a half in there just to getting accustomed to the electric fence. And the fact that we can run around and play and have a good time, but yet we still have the security of our little pig hut that we have down there. And then once they're 80 to 100 pounds, then it's out in the great wide open. And from there, I'll just I'll use uh, poly wire, and we just build paddocks like crazy. And every four to five days, I move them. Um, some guy, you know, and, and I don't know if you guys are familiar with like beef pasture. They move them every day. But with the pigs, I want them to disturb enough area in here to keep the weed pressure down and the burdocks and everything that I keep them there for four days, which works out handy because that's about how much feed my feeder holds and my water. So I don't have to uh, dump anything or move the heavy equipment. I can just move my small water and my small feeder and move it to the next paddock, set the strings, and they're good to go. So if you guys have any questions, please ask them. I'll probably circle back a couple times here, but if you want to hit the button. So here's our pegs. I don't. We buy these, these were Hampshire Berkshire crosses, except for this one here. This is Whitey, we're really creative with the names here. <laughs> but this is old Whitey. And uh, they, they all finished well. She was a lot leaner than the, uh, the Berkshire Hampshire crosses. Um, but I think there's a video of her. This, this pig, she never walked. She ran or she laid down, and that was it. And I think she burned off half of her fat cover just running. Um, so that's that's how they go. But this is our pasture. This is uh, I moved them, and then in the later in the afternoon, they just really settle down, and they'll kind of find a shade area. And this is later in the afternoon, and they're just relaxing and chilling. The feeder is actually right over here. And yeah, here's our perimeter fencing, and this is all just it's just trash wood back in there. But they. They really go crazy back there. Uh, they eat the leaves off box elder. You drop a box elder, or they pull the branches down. Any new shoots coming out of box elder, they just, you think they're a little billy coat, and they just chew it right down to nothing. It's crazy. Plus all this, and then they'll, they roll sod, and they do all kinds of damage, but it's all controlled damage because we're putting them where we want. So that's fun. This is just more pictures here. This is later in the fall. We moved them into our woods. So there's the perimeter fence or our division fence there is that white poly wire. Um, people ask me, you know, is it hard to get them used to the electric fence? No. The hardest part is when you go to move them to the next paddock is to get them across where that fence was. Pigs are smart and they don't like pain. They'll get zapped once and that's it. They'll remember. It's like they can smell where that fence was. <laughs> and they, you have a hard time like when I do a move, I roll up the wire 20 feet and I let it sit and walk away. And they'll slowly filter through because, and now I had one old girl, this one here, that she wouldn't want to cross where that was. She wouldn't, you know, she wanted in the new grass, but she didn't want to even deal with where that fence was. So they're really smart that way. So once they get to be 200 pounds, it only takes one strand of wire to hold them in. You know, I mean, it's just, it's crazy. You wouldn't think it. You'd think that a pig is going to be hard to contain, but they, they're so content being out and doing being a pig that they don't care about getting into trouble. Now, if you you know leave them there too long so they run down all the grass and they get bored, then maybe you'd have problems. That's why we got to move them every four or five days. Um, here's, yeah, here's their chewing on these shoots that come out of the box elder. We have lots of box elders, so that's no problem. Lots of feed that way. They just go crazy like that. And then, yeah, this is all cornfield back here. So that for oh, probably six weeks, they bordered a cornfield. And I, they were placing bets on my family, which pig was going to get out first and who had to go chase it through the corn. And I never, knock on wood, I never had a problem. 
that they stayed there the whole time. We never had any bad storms, and we never had any power outages either. So <laughs> that's uh, maybe one of the downsides of electric fence. Yep. Go ahead. Ryan, did, were there yeah. acorns? Do you know? No. That? So my whole my whole plan too is our we have a lot of oak and oak savanna is what they call it. Um, and last year with that late frost we had, we had zero apples or acorns. And now is my whole plan is I'm going to finish these things up on the hillside where it's all acorns and apples. Because I've, I've read about it. A lot of this isn't uh, revolutionary. Um, there's a guy called Joel Salton. I got some books too I'll lay out later that you can look at. But he's in South Virginia and he's a leader in small scale farming and I guess un unconventional farming. Um, and he does a lot of the, I copy a lot of his stuff. As far as moving the pigs through the woods, he feeds them on chestnuts because that's what's common down there. <coughs> um, supposedly it has a great flavor to the pork. I've never had chestnut pork. I was hoping to have acorn pork, um, but there wasn't any. There was very few of the squirrels that got them way before. It wasn't worth building the fence up through the woods this year. So hopefully this year now, um, this fall, we'll have a good crop. And then I have plenty of apple trees too. So that's also part of our thing. Video cannot be played, huh? Awesome. We need to get the space for it again. That was just, I had two videos about our pigs. One was a pasture move and then showed them going across. And another one was, because the, the pigs are in such a low stress situation, plus I, I mean, I, I see those pigs every day. And uh, you're talking about the millennials. That's part of their thing is like, well, how is it raised? I'm like, listen, I, I meet these pigs every day. That's the first thing I do in the morning. I let the chickens out, I go see the pigs. And I talk to them, I say hi, I scratch almost all of them behind the ears. And they, they gobble that up. Like they love that, oh, someone is actually talking to their pig. Some people might find it a little strange that they're talking to their future meat, but I don't know, they, they gobble it up. All, and not just millennials either, but a lot of people that have been disconnected from their food source. They, they don't even realize that pigs are raised like this or raised in barns. They think it comes shrink wrap at the store. You know, pork and pig sometimes isn't a uh, word that is associated, unfortunately. That's a big, big deal, and luckily you guys are here to fix that because you're the next wave of people who talk about where your food comes from. So, but off that soapbox. Um, <laughs> So anyway, I had a couple slides here on our, our fencing, our feeding, our water. Um, our fencing is all portable. Um, even our corner posts, most of them I build with just T-posts um, because I don't have to have such heavy duty fences um, and they're electrified. That don't have a lot of strain. Um, and it's, it's all gotta be easy to move because if I, for some reason, burn out a pasture, or maybe it's really overgrown, I want them to really dig it up and clear it out. I won't be able to move them back there. I don't want to waste the resources of posts and fencing material to sit there for a year and not be able to use that stuff because posts are expensive. If you ever bought any, they're like five bucks a piece or even two bucks at an auction, right? So I mean, this stuff adds up. So everything's gotta be portable. We gotta be able to move it so you can hit the button. So I use T-posts and step-in posts and all this, Land that I run, remember we can't farm it conventionally. You can't run a corn planter across it. You can't run a grain drill across it, right? It's goat country. So <laughs> I don't have, I don't even have to worry about spacing out my posts. I have to put them where they need to be to hold the wire in place. Because I, I got gullies, I got steep stuff. It is, my dad thinks I'm nuts, but it works, <laughs> right? It works. Um, so right now I use aluminum wire. Um, I switched to aluminum wire because I heard a rumor that deer don't knock it down. And when I switched to aluminum, I haven't had deer trouble knocking it down. I don't know. They suppose they can see it. I don't know. That was the rumor. It's a little more expensive than just conventional galvanized. Um, but it is lightweight. It's easy to tie. It's easy to stretch. Um, it's, it's really easy to deal with. And it's got a higher conductivity. So if you have a weaker fencer or if you have a longer runs, you get better... Uh, better voltage and amperage through your line. I also use polywire for all my temporary. So this is a, this is actually one of my 
permanent fences. If, you, if I have any, this is one of them, because <laughs> this is my mom's yard off to this direction, right? And it's only two wire, but I haven't had any troubles. But uh, so all my, my temporary fences or my division fences will run perpendicular. And like in here, I just step off, unless there's a, where I have to put a post, I just step off three paces and drive a post. So, and you can kind of tell when it's time to make division fences, well, how big do I need? Well, if it took them a week to try and graze down what you're on, well, maybe I need to move that to, I want it every four to five days. So there's a little trial and error. So sometimes you hit it right on, you're like, oh, four days and there's no more grass, perfect, time to move. Other times you're like, oh, I really overguessed what was here. Or they burned it out in two days and I need to make the paddock bigger. So, But anyway, we use poly wire on reels, so it's easy to just, I step in a bunch of posts, run the poly wire, and I'll move re besides the actual moving of the pig, only to set up the fence and wire only takes me 10 minutes, if that. But then I gotta wait 20 minutes for old Beulah to get her butt crossed across where it's supposed to be. So, or Whitey is crazy and she runs back. So that happens too. I mean, they're animals, they have their own brain. Um, I did, when I first started, I priced out everything, right? Because I'm a nerd that way. And a high tensile is gonna be kind of cheap, right? And you can run, and you don't have to use as many posts. I'm like, this is gonna be great. So I bought all this high tensile stuff. And it is great stuff. I've used it on the ranch before, but it was all flat, straight stretches. <coughs> well, when you get into this goat country, that stuff doesn't work. It's too heavy to drag through, and you have all these little crooks and corners trying to go around down trees, and I pasture everything. Um, so uh, if you're looking at trying to fence in some corner property somewhere, don't use high tensile. It isn't worth it, <laughs> in my opinion. Um, it was. It takes more, you have to crimp everything, you gotta have strainers, and it, it costs a little more that way. Um, per foot it was actually cheaper, but it was a lot more, it was a pain to work with. And I switched to aluminum Mac and slap up a whole fence in half an hour, so just because of the ease of working. It doesn't look as pretty, but it works, it works pretty good. So. so our water, Right now, because I'm so far removed from the, the buildings, I would have to have like 10 garden hoses to reach wherever I want to be. So I have a portable stock tank, or a poly tank, it's 350 gallon, it's up on a hill. I fill that because the hose will reach that. And then that runs all the rest of my pipe. I just run a line along my fence. And then I could have water to all my paddocks, or paddocks, <coughs> pastures. And then at the end of it, I just move. This is my portable water. It's a hot water. I bought it at Mills Fleet Farm for 100 bucks. And it's 100 gallon. And I, at four or five days with six to eight hogs, this is empty by the time they're ready to move. That's just kind of how it worked out. And it's really lucky and it's easy. It's lightweight. It only weighs probably 35 pounds, 40 pounds when it's empty. You can just slide it to the next paddock when it's empty and it's, it works really slick. There's a little float in there, so you can adjust the water level. They, it gets dirty because pigs are dirty, like their nose with mud. But other than that, it, it works really great. And then my feeder is just a Sioux feeder. It's a 200 pound um, feeder. I have a cover for it because everything sits outside. There's no shelter. Once they're, you know, if they've been on a farm for a month and they're doing good, there's no more, they find their own shelter. So I got a cover for the, the feeder and they live out there. Their ration is just the, I think I talked, but the standard grower ration for hogs. I get it from Paulson's Feed Service. It's not non-GMO or organic or certified or anything like that. It, it comes right from their grain bin. Um, but so far, when I've been marketing, no one's asked me for organic. And no, one, no one's even asked about where the feed comes from. The people who I sell to, they don't care about that. They just want to know if they're happy, fat animals and they've lived a good life. So my wife's motto is they've had a good life, they just had one bad day. <laughs> so, some of you might know my wife, so that, that fits, but you can hit the button. All right, so some of my marketing, you guys talked about a little bit, word of mouth. Uh, once you get a customer that likes what you're doing, that's the 
the best marketing tool you'll ever have because they'll spread the word. And they'll, they'll do a good job and they'll spread the word to people that'll fit as a good customer. They won't just tell everybody, they won't yell it from the mountaintops. They'll, they'll just tell all their friends that'll make you good customers. Uh, and because of that, I don't have many problems, I don't have any complaints. Um, a lot of my marketing is on social media, and a lot of that is just because, I mean, you guys know you can talk to so many people so quick now that I'm a big, I was against Facebook, man, for years. I've been in trouble on that thing, all right? I didn't even have an account until a month ago or a year ago. But uh, now I'm on it and I see the power of it. It's just crazy. You know, I post a video and a week later, like 900 people have seen it. That's nuts, right? What a pig. A pig eating some grass. And I, 900 people have seen that video. I don't know 900 people. So it's pretty nuts. But And then, so I sold a few... I sold a few pigs. I sell a lot of chicken on Facebook, just from people spreading it. Uh, and then Craigslist, that's, it's free. You can put an ad on there. And people on Craigslist, yeah, a lot of us search on it, but most people are looking to buy. And anyone that's looking for food on there is looking to buy. So I've had really good luck on Craigslist. All the pigs went on Craigslist. And, oh, man, probably 40 chickens so far went on Craigslist. Oh, more than that, 60 chickens. Yeah, people on people on the internet they like to spend money. That's good. All right. So that's it for my pork. Is there any more pork stuff? I was just I had a couple slides on what else we do, but otherwise. Anybody have any pig questions? I kind of rambled a little bit, but. What kind of a do you use a solar fencer? No, I'm close enough to the buildings that I can. I just ran a line up okay. through, so I don't. I don't. If I thought about it, <coughs> if I have to replace the one I have. I don't know if I can go to solar, but I might go to a battery powered so I can just move it around. A solar array, a good one's like 300 bucks. So, so what, what are they like when you have to bring them in and load them up to? Oh, yeah. So, <laughs> yeah, let's get on that. Oh, well, I just was so the curious. So prob the first problem we had is I had, I had six pigs, right? I'm not a big time farmer, right? <laughs> but I had six pigs, and two of them weren't performing. And uh, they were three to four uh, weeks younger, they're a different litter. The four of them, even Whitey, came out all the same litter, I guess, the guy I bought it from. But these two, they were brother and sister from another litter. And they just never performed, they were always kind of skittish. They were just a little, they were shy, I'm like, well, whatever, we'll be able to work with them, we can fix them. And uh, they just wouldn't perform. And all of a sudden, one day, one had swollen joints okay, something's wrong, we had problems. And I, I don't feed any antibiotic or medicated feed or anything like that, but I am a believer in modern medicine. So if, if we can help something, we're gonna help it. So I called the vet, come to find out it's called mycoplasma. And it's something that pigs get, sometimes from the soil or other things, but it causes a lot of arthritis in the joints. And the one pig couldn't hardly walk. So I called the vet, it was a $12 shot, I gave the two little pigs a shot because the other one was showing the same signs. It just wasn't as bad. And uh, fixed them up, right? But I, I showed you where these pigs live. Well, how do you catch a pig to give it a shot? <laughs> and that was a fun... My dad, Paul and was my dad. Anyway. He wasn't happy about that one, but he helped. And uh, we ended up having to build a corral out of cattle panels. And <laughs> they ran up up a draw and they hit a dead tree and they got trapped up there and we cornered them and we caught them but it took about 45 minutes to get two shots. Now I learned you just cut the feed away from them for like six hours and they, as soon as you throw a little bucket of feed in the feeder they'll come running and you can pet them and everything while they're eating if they're hungry. <laughs> so next time if I have to do it again that's what it'll be. But, so but I mean my part of that story I guess is for $12 I, I fixed that pig and within a week you didn't even know I was sick anymore. It was, it was I know some people say, oh, I'll never do medication and all that and save that pig. So, yeah? What's a paddock? A paddock? So, a paddock is you have your huge, big pasture, right? But I don't want them to run on the whole pasture all the time because I want them to manage the grass and keep the grass in a growing stage. So, I'm just going to build a temporary fence in just part of that pasture. 
and that will be my pad up. And then when that grass gets down to three, four inches, then I'll move them to the next paddock. A paddock is just whatever you make your little temporary fence to be. So. All right, any others? Yeah. How big are they when they go to market? So I don't have a live scale, but I shoot for a 200 pound hanging weight. And that's that actually was my average. Even my small ones, they finished out 180 pound hanging weight. Um, but they were, they almost looked small compared to the other ones were like 210. 220 the big one was mm -hmm. and the pork chops were just gorgeous on there they were huge and they weren't top the meat's a little redder on passion pork i think it's from the exercise i don't know and then i know that their marbling is less that's why i was we were talking about the Berkshires. Mm -hmm. they have more marbling in the fat and i think that helped me because i tell my customers when they get them i said just just to let you know you're going to burn your first set of pork chops you're going to dry them out they're going to be sawed up like, oh, no, no, we know. And I'm usually right because they cook them like a conventional pork chop and there's a lot more saturated fat and it's a little, it's a little heavier. And ours are pretty lean. You cook them quick and they're good to go. So it, it takes a little bit of different cooking style uh, versus just their store-bought stuff. But the meat, the, the bacon is so firm, like it's not sloppy or slimy at all. It's just, it's a real firm red cut. And I, I love it. Pork shoulder, I'm a huge pork, I like pork steak, and they're really good. I think it's from all exercise. Do you have so. pictures of your, like your meat cuts, that, like the ones you put on Facebook that make me drool? Do you have those? No, it's okay. just on Facebook. No, I didn't. Okay, no, I that's not good. Yeah, I do have Facebook, so I, I put everything on there. This I just put together now. I guess that's I didn't fine. think to put the meat, but yeah. I'm just, I was just curious. Go ahead. Yeah. Any other questions? Pigs are fun and they're easy to get into. And a lot of you guys, I mean, how many of you guys raise pigs? I know the Lawson's, but you guys do. You guys all raise pigs for a fair, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, my, my pigs probably wouldn't win a grand champion, but they taste pretty good. And they're, they're, <laughs> cheap, to, they're cheap to grow, you know. I, I had land that was just sitting there. It's funny because the, for exchange of the land and the use of electricity and the water and all that, that's what I call it, because I'm running for my parents. It cost me about 300 bucks. You know, so it was about 100 bucks an acre. <laughs> but I made I made out. I mean I, I I made the profit I wanted to and I sold all sold all my pigs. So and everything was great. And we're in it again this year and I already got a couple sold, so I have them sold before I even have them bought. But that's it's a good thing. It's a good thing. That's how I know how many to order, so yeah. it's alright. How many are you gonna order this year? Six for sure, maybe eight. I don't wanna get it over my head. Just because I don't, I don't want to buy a new feeder. And I don't know if ten pigs would handle my little feeder. I don't want to throw a bag in there twice a day. You know, It'd be a lot of extra work. Right now, the way I have it, I just I check them twice a day, but really I could only have to check them once, and that's just to make sure the water and the feeder there and the electric's working. And I mean, it takes me ten minutes to check pigs unless I have to move them or fill the feeder, which is all on the same day. I fill the feeder, move the feeder with water, and fill them all. And move the pigs all at the same time. So 45 minutes every four to five days, that's all the work to really have into it besides checking every day, you know. And they're doing a lot of work for me. So right now all that old pasture stuff is cleared out. There's no burdocks, nothing left. They destroyed it all. So it's great. And it's just starting to come back now. So. Any others? Bryce? <laughs> Your typical feeder size, so 50 pounds, 80 pounds. That's where I like them. Lately, it seems like everyone wants to sell 100 or 125s, but that's what I have to get. I guess what I have to get. I guess. But I like them so I can catch them by hand and throw them in the back of the truck. No, I'm taking trailer. So. <laughs> yeah. How tall is your fence, like off the ground? Oh, so the bottom wire is 10 inches and top wire is 20 inches. And if you were going to run just one, I'd probably have it at 14, 16, somewhere in there, about knee high. You want it just at their shoulder. And, yeah, that's a good question, too. So I have one section of a fence where I first turn them out in the first paddock that I actually have three wires. 
and the bottom one is six inches off the ground or eight inches off the ground, which is great. But as pigs, pigs will follow that fence when you first turn them in there, they'll follow it. It's like they're just figuring out where they can go. Well, then the second lap, they start rototilling and they'll flip side up on that bottom wire and they'll short out your fence. So that's also something you every day you need to check where they're at and make sure they're not throwing stuff. I mean, they'll throw. Once they got into the woods, they'll throw logs up on that thing. I mean, they just, you know, they're playing and having fun. They don't know. They just run into stuff. They start, they start digging, they'll run right into the fence and get shot. They just have no awareness of what's going on once they start working. It's crazy. But it's kind of fun to watch. Have you ever had one get sprayed by a skunk? No. Why, is that a thing? I don't know. <laughs> oh, no, I've never had any. I don't any. know if they're outside, you know. No. Oh, yeah, no, so I've never had any problems like that. The only problem I've ever heard of is Joel Salton out in Virginia. He had one, like, in all of his years of farming, of doing this, which is like 30 or 40, he had one killed by a bear. So I'm like, well, that's pretty good odds. I can, I can take that. But otherwise, no, I've never had any. I was worried about, like, a thunderstorm or lightning or something if they take off. But, they, you I mean, you've seen pigs sleep at the fair. You can't get them up. That's the way they are out here, too. I thought they'd be wild like deer, and they're not. They are right away when you first turn them out because they're kind of funny, but, you know, to try, and catch, to try and catch them to treat them or to load them. So to load them, I guess back to that, sorry. <laughs> I, the first time we tried to, like, hurt them like animals, right? That does not work. You can't hurt pigs. You can with boards, but it takes a lot of work. So all I do is I just back the trailer up, throw a pan of feed in there, and walk away, and they load themselves, and I shut the gate. You know, I just leave it there for, like, I don't know, half an hour. They just walk into the trailer themselves. But I also run them back to my little shed that I have. I just plan it out that, okay, I got to take them to falls in three weeks, so I'll just make sure the paddocks get used down around this way. And then that last week, they end up close to the shed, and then I just throw them in the shed, back the trailer up. And they can't, I got it set up so they can't go anywhere else besides in the trailer. And, the first, man, the first batch, I thought, thought my dad was really going to have a bad back or something. But, or the big one, maybe. I don't know. But he, uh, we got them loaded, and I said, the second ones, or the next ones, I'm not doing that. And we just I threw some feet in there, and they climbed right in. It was crazy. Shut the door, and they're happy as can be. Laid right down. So, learn, lesson learned there. Sometimes you don't always have to work hard. Let the pig do some work. So. Any other? Well, these will go quick. These are just other things we do. I stole these photos because I have, these are Salton style portable uh, broiler pens, right? They're two foot, like eight foot by eight foot. Um, I'm redoing all the steel on mine. I had steel on before and it's way too heavy, so I've got white PVC plastic that I'm putting down now. Um, so mine's all tore apart, that's why I didn't take any pictures of it. But the, each one will hold 50 birds. And uh, we move it twice a day because they put down a lot of manure. I mean, broilers, if you've ever raised chicks that are broilers, they, they eat a lot and they get rid of a lot. Um, so we move it twice a day. We got a water just like this set up, five gallons. And uh, you put feed in twice a day. And then that's it. Um, the funny thing about these chickens, if you've ever raised broilers, this is not to contain them. This is to keep all the bad things away from them. Because I, I wish I would have taken a video. I've set the water and the feeder down and moved the, let, let taken this off of them. And the birds didn't move for 20 minutes. They want to be by the feeder or the water. They're just, they are hungry, hungry, hungry hippos. That's all they are. So this is just to keep the raccoons and the fishers and things like that off the birds. But, so the, the birds will be in here. The first batch I raised is three weeks. Um, just because it's the temperature's really cool right now. I have I just got my birds last week and they'll I'll have them in the brooder and then into a second coop for three weeks and then hopefully by then the rain and the cold and everything will be sorta of done and they'll go into these pens. And then after that, once the summer's in all the batches they'll be in the brooder for two weeks. And as soon as they have enough feathers that they're a chicken now, they go out into these pens and they'll be out there for four weeks. I butcher at six weeks. Um, I butchered in the past at seven weeks, and then you get a lot bigger bird, and I, I personally like that, but my customers don't. Plus, they add a little extra fat, and uh, customers, some of them don't like it, some of them do. 
get a lot of flare-ups on a grill, that's the one that I've had. So, um, this is just a picture of this guy that Joel South and raised him. He runs all these like 20 different things, and he just moves them across his paddock or his pasture. He runs his wheat cattle ahead of him, mows the grass down to four inches, and then runs these birds right behind him. Um, I think the, the numbers I read is 500 birds can put down up to 300 pounds of nitrogen per acre. So it's a good, healthy dose. Plus, you're getting a lot of poultry. You know, you raise them, I raise mine, I try to shoot for a five pound dressed bird. So that's a lot of meat, too. You know. I use I don't know their live weight. Like I said, usually it's five pounds to six pounds. Or four and a half to five and a half. That's what I'm shooting for. That's what they'll weigh when I'm all dressed up. So they're what, oh, six pounds, seven pounds maybe. Corners, I call them bowling balls. That's pretty much what they are as a child size bowling ball. I mean, they are just a dense. Cornish crosses are a dense bird. These are my layers. This is my newest contraption. I haven't even put it online yet to show it off. Um, that's our layer hut. It's got a mesh floor in it. And I, this here just moves around. It'll spend a lot of time in the pig pasture. And all my layers just pile out in the morning. And it cuts my feed down by like, oh, two thirds maybe. They, they scavenge everything. We got a lot of crickets. And I'm sure all of you guys have seen the worms lately because all the rain. These guys go nuts. So, and then we get a lot of eggs off. And then too, if people, eggs are cheap right now, but yeah, people like brown eggs that have been raised on a farm, they have a little bit of a story to them. And it's, I mean, raising layers, that's fun. That's easy work. It's like having milk cows and you don't have to milk. You know, <laughs> just go out and get the eggs twice a day, once a day, yeah. Do you, like, ever have problems with, like, a pecking order? Yeah, right away. Then they figure it out and everything's good. I also had two roosters at one point, because I bought some, I bought hens, I thought they were all hens. All of a sudden one morning, one was crowing. Didn't get all hens, there was a rooster in the mix. And my other, I had a rooster from our first patches years ago. I think it's like four years old now. There was a pecking order there. <laughs> I mean, he, there was a dominance factor. But uh, now, no, I can introduce the new ones. And uh, it doesn't seem, they, they shy, but they, there isn't a big issue. And in our market garden, I run, I guess you call it organically grown. I don't use any pesticides or fertilizer. I just use compost and then uh, compost, lime, and then sometimes like an alfalfa meal if I can find it really cheap. But I don't, mainly compost, lots of compost. And I do 30 inch beds. This is actually, this is all a new bed that I'm building now. So I'm killing off the lawn slash edge of my property and then uh, so I, I don't have to deal with the sod as much. These are all spinach here that I overwintered. I planted these on Halloween and they, I've had a low tunnel over them and they've survived all winter. You can see the plastic there. That's all spinach. And then this is carrots. That, I, that was an experiment too just to see if they live and they survive. They don't look very good down in here. And I don't know if they got hit hard with frost. I mean, we've harvested all these and ate them. Then I have, these are all cover crop, and this here is some cover crop, but in the wintertime, I store all my layers on my, where I live, and I have a chicken coop. Well, on a couple warm days, I kicked them out because it was so nice, I wanted them to go away and play. Well, they tore up all this freaking cover crop. It was all winter rye, and they just destroyed it. I don't know, they ate all the little shoots and everything. It was crazy. So that's what we're doing now. That's our newest adventure. Yeah, here's more of the plastic. Just suppressing, killing the weeds and killing the grass. Can you do watermelon in there? In Oh, in there? Yeah. Maybe. I like don't know. Anything? Watermelon doesn't, it spreads out it so spreads much so though. Yeah, so you'd have to have a they... huge, it takes up a lot of space. Um, I did spinach because spinach on its own without a cover it can go down into the teens with frost and and still survive, especially if it's small. So I wanted to test that, and it did. I mean, we had, however cold it was, there was one layer of plastic that was, you know, two feet tall, and that's all it was that saved that stuff. 
And it was just little. It just sprouted. It, every plant was probably that big around, spread out with four petals. I'm like, well, that stuff's going to get torched. Nope. Survived. So you're eating that and selling that now, aren't you? I haven't sold any because it's an experiment. So oh. I don't have enough to really... Uh -huh. uh, but there's been a lot of, I just posted a couple of pictures jokingly, like, hey, look, my spinach survived. <laughs> and I had people ask me, like, oh, cool, how much? Well, okay, hold on. <laughs> we got to do some math here. <laughs> uh, but it, I like spinach. Some people don't. I also do lettuce. Um, head lettuce doesn't work well in the wintertime. Um, but the small leaf lettuce that you get at the restaurant sometime, or they call it, I think it's mescaline mix, that stuff works really well, as good as spinach. So, but that stuff, you, you, you plant it just loose, not in rows or anything, and then you just cut it with a scissor, so it's kind of harder to harvest. Um, plus, it takes, it takes a lot of space to make a salad out of that stuff because it's all really small. And there's some of my radishes I planted in the late fall, too. That was probably November when I pulled those. Because, I mean, radishes, the only, that's the only thing that grows faster than chicken. I mean, three weeks and you got radishes. And they're good? Alright, I think that's... You need to button again, I don't know how many more. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Every month but one. Every month. Yeah, that's the end of it. Okay, anybody have any other questions for Ryan? Alright, thank you. Yeah, thank you. talking to people I get the one thing I don't like about Facebook is I have more people talking and asking me about how I raise things which is great and that's something for you guys if you're gonna raise animals that's something you, you don't want to do but you have to almost because they want it they don't know where the food comes from my wife's a teacher this is no kidding she had somebody ask they're talking about making eat or a carrot cake and they're talking and they go what's in a carrot cake so my wife's been listening off all this stuff because she made carrot cake and the one girl's like, what, there's carrots in it? <laughs> no kidding, they had no idea there was carrots in carrot cake. She thought it was carrot cake because they drew a carrot. We have a niece who is approaching 40 years old, and for Christmas, I send her meat, her family meat. Mm -hmm. And she doesn't know that pork chops come from pigs and steak yep. comes from cattle. Don't be. She has no clue. I mean, we joke about it, but it's, it's yeah. real. I, I just find it, I think it's our responsibility, we know, I think it's our responsibility to tell these people, like, listen, you know, something had to die, you need meat, that's the way it is, yeah. and it's you can't get a pork chop off a chicken. <laughs> 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 yeah. Yeah. And you have to tell your stories about how you care for your lifestyle. Absolutely, because yeah, I'm not, I'm not going to talk one way or another about what's good or bad, but just do what you do, and tell people how you do things. It's, it's, it's crazy. It's, people don't know. Yeah, a lot of them want to know. Yeah. I mean, we're in, like, where we live, or not you anymore, but we're in Golden Plum country. People don't know if there's chickens in those barns. They just think that some rich person put up a big pole shed. And that's all it is, you know. They got boats in there or something. People don't know if that steam coming out in the wintertime, that's chicken chips, you know. Yeah. Uh, kind of the same thing with people not knowing about like the livestock. Um, at fair, um, I was sitting by my pig pen and someone came up to me and said, um, what kind of animals are are these? And I'm like, pigs. And then they're like, what do you use What do you use them for? I'm like, they can eat. They're like, oh, I thought you just looked at them. All right, thank you. Yep.
last time 